have these two great superstars with us. The capital. All right. Sorry about the delay, everybody. Ennis? Okay, while we wait for um, a few of the offices to trickle in, uh, we will go ahead and slowly start with our program. Um, for those of you who might be watching us live stream, uh, if you can uh, just please be aware that this is part also of our webinar series uh, set by the Committee on Present Danger China and the Captive Nations Coalition uh, of the CPDC. Uh, we're very honored to have these two very brave heroes today. Um, and uh, for any folks that will be um, coming in, please uh, mindful, be mindful of the door. Further ado, uh, 
So let me start by our introduction. My name is uh, Sehun Kim. Um, I am currently serving as the director of the Captive Nations Coalition of the Committee on Present Danger of China. And uh, we, uh, our coalition was created back in uh, 2020 of August um, to stand and to advocate for all the communities that have been fell victims to the Chinese Communist Party. In the recent years, we have uh, became we have become a good advocate as well for a number of the Belt and Road Initiative nations, and we are very proud uh, to stand with all of the communities that have um, their voices taken away uh, either through their local corruption or the um, the long hand of the CCP in general. Um, for our speakers today, I'd like to just give a bit of an introduction. Uh, we have Mr. Enes Cantor Freedom. Um, as, as needless to say, he is a hero to all of us. Uh, Mr. Freedom is a professional American basketball player and a free agent. Uh, in addition to his successful NBA career, uh, Mr. Freedom has been a vocal human rights advocate, especially regarding the dictatorships in Turkey and recently in China. Uh, since 2013, Mr. Freedom became an active critic of the Turkish dictator, President uh, Recep uh, Tayyip Erdogan, uh, for the ongoing mass corruption in Turkey, uh, including all the human rights violations. And in 2019, Mr. Freedom also became a vocal critic of the Chinese Communist Party for his repression of the Uyghurs, Tibetans, and all other persecuted communities in China. Despite the multiple setbacks and attacks in the recent years, including the recent ousting from the NBA, Mr. Freedom uh, continues to stand for human rights issues and around the world. On top of his advocacy, Mr. Freedom has also been organi organizing basketball camps for the younger generation to foster a peaceful society uh, through sports. Um, and so if we can give a little bit of round of applause for Mr. and Mr. Dr. Freedom. As for our next speaker, um, he has, uh, obviously it's needless to say, Mr. Roger Robinson has been a great hero uh, to all of us. Um, currently he is the, uh, serving as the president and also as a co-founder of the Prague Security Studies Institute located in Czech Czechoslovakia, uh, no, no, Czech, no, Czech Republic, I, I apologize. Um, Mr. Robinson has also been a, uh, I, I apologize. Mr. Robinson also served as the vice president of the Chase International Manhattan Bank. Um, he's also served um, in mul for multiple um, roles within uh, the United States government uh, as the national security advisor. He also, he also has served um, as the advisor, personal advisor um, to President Reagan. And as, as we have all know, one of the greatest accomplishments by Mr. Robinson is to come up with the financial plans, or should I say them, he masterminded the great financial plans um, to take down the Soviet Union and essentially just create uh, the, all the free nations of Eastern Europe uh, and Central Asia and so on and so forth. So we're very honored to have him here. We're very honored to have these two folks um, standing for uh, the captive nations of the past and the captive nations of the present. Uh, we also, and finally, before uh, we go to our speakers, um, we I would like to just uh, share that today um, Cardinal Zen of Hong Kong is facing uh, a trial, and uh, we we wish for everyone's prayers uh, for his safety and for um, and, and for a successful, speedy trial that would come out to his favor. Um, we also would like to just mention quickly, and um, I apologize, Mr. Uh, uh, there was a journalist in Mongolia who has recently been um, jailed uh, because of his critic of criticism of the Chinese Communist Party, um, and his name um, is uh, we. Uh, Mr. Mukbeer Chuludorj, um, and he has been an advocate for the Southern Mongolian rights for many, many years. But um, so without further ado, um, as, as we stand with these particular individuals, I'd like to hand off the mic firstly to Mr. Roger Robinson to give uh, him a bit of an opportunity to explain to us um, the, uh, the process of decoupling from the CCP. So.
Well, um, I want to thank Sehan and the Captive Nations Coalition, as well as the Committee on the Present Danger China for the opportunity to share some thoughts with you today. Sehun had asked uh, the impossible, which is in my, in a 15 minute talk, uh, to try to put us in the picture as to how we got where we are and, uh, and where we go from here. <laughs> that's, a, that's a Herculean task, but I thought that uh, a few observations in that direction would be useful. Uh, you know, we are, it's a sorry state of affairs that we find ourselves in, in the bilateral relationship with China, putting it mildly. Now, part of uh, this uh, unfortunate set of circumstances has been a function of decades of distraction by the United States. First, we had the Cold War, where obviously our attention was uh, focused on the Soviet Union, <clears throat> followed not so long thereafter on, by the war on terror, uh, which took, again, our, our vision away from both Russia and China, uh, particularly China, and, uh, and obviously turned it to the Middle East and elsewhere. And I would say that um, what's common to the Soviet experience and the Chinese experience is the whole detente theology, if I can call it that, whereby we had the naive view, and many still do, that commercial and financial bridge building with adversaries, even totalitarian police states, uh, ultimately will lead to greater political pluralism within those societies, as well as greater geopolitical harmony uh, if we just stay the course. And as a result, China had 25 years of exploiting uh, our free market international trading and financial systems. Uh, while we thought this was all very clever in terms of WTO admission and others, uh, we were witnessing uh, one of the greatest free lunch programs of all time uh, for our adversaries at our expense. Uh, Deng Xiaoping uh, deserves some credit because of his hide and bide philosophy, which is hide China's capabilities, bide your time, uh, don't show your hand, prematurely. I, there's all kinds of ways to interpret this, but it was uh, devastatingly effective uh, during his period and those leaders that followed him uh, to a great extent. It's only when President Xi showed up on the scene in, I think it was 2012, where we started to see China's true colors. Uh, here we have a fellow that, as I've talked about, is a rather ham-handed, crude boor uh, who is afflicted by terrible policy judgment, all a windfall for us, and as I'll talk about later, uh, is possibly going to save our bacon as we try to sacrifice our own freedoms. Uh, to, uh, to this totalitarian state. But, um, but it was only she that, that uh, uh, really, again, showed China's hand in instances like uh, the Belt and Road, demonstrating that this was a, was a, uh, a strategic initiative, nothing to do with just benign commercial and economic uh, development. And, um, and there's a whole list that I'd like to just touch on uh, a little later. But for now, if we think about uh, what the CCP has gotten done over these 25 years or so, trillions of dollars of funds, of investment funds, from average American retail investors have flowed to the coffers of the CCP. That's trillions with a T. Uh, just think about that for a moment. 
uh, because no one then or now is paying much attention to the money. We don't have a CFIUS uh, for finance, you notice. Uh, we've never uh, tried to monitor who's coming to our markets on the part of China. Are these sanctioned entities? Are they human rights abusers? Are they national security violators of the type that are building and militarizing uh, the islands in the South China Sea? We never bothered to look, uh, either officially or in terms of Wall Street uh, diligence, which in the areas of human rights and national security is basically uh, non-existent. If you think about the scale, moving on, of the technology and IP theft, it's been taking place at a cosmic rate. I mean, they, they steal it, they apply it, and they field it uh, rather rapidly into their military to the point where we have a near peer competitor now uh, militarily, uh, which is uh, a stunning turn of events in terms of our giveaways uh, uh, in the history of, of the human condition, as far as I'm concerned. Uh, we have allowed them to corner markets, witness rare earths, lithium, cobalt. I mean, we could go through a list of those. We've allowed them to compromise countries and capture them. Not just that, but regions and even continents, if you look at Africa and uh, the inordinate influence even in our friends in Australia. I mean, the point is that the Chinese create a fearsome levels of dependency as policy. I mean, they excel at this. And as soon as you think that it's too good to be true and you're doing brilliantly with subsidized financing and vertically integrated uh, deals, package deals, uh, where it just takes space, for example. They provide the satellites, they provide the launch facilities, they build the ground stations, they provide the operating personnel, uh, they provide the training, and again, 100% subsidized financing at, uh, obviously, by definition, below market rates. Uh, you know, a dollar down gets you a space sector if you're Belarus or Bolivia, quite literally. And that's how they do business. You only find out later that they expect you, of course, to, do to tow their line in every multilateral fora uh, as to what they believe uh, the governing principles and behavior and norms and standards should be uh, for the global space domain. They collect you know, right now, 69 countries that are voting with them in this way. We're not even fielding opposition to this kind of thing. We, we're seeing this as normal commercial activity. I mean, today, after all we've experienced in terms of being taken to the cleaners, it's hard to believe that we're still buying into the same gambit again and again and again. And you might ask, why? How can that be? And I'll give you the answer. It's greed, number one. It's short-term thinking, number two. It's naivete or outright f stupidity. You can't, you can't exclude that. And that's where we sit. But I can tell you that it's a cynical business on the part of the, those that know better and it's the, at the root of this, uh, of this problem. So, you know, human rights abuses have gone unchecked, as we know. It's not even part of ESG when you look at the Wall Street world. Uh, they never deign to include national security. I mean, that's somebody else's job. Or human rights, well, heaven forfend, we try to judge what is human rights and is that going to restrict our ability to invest in some of our favorite Chinese companies? Hell no, we're not gonna play that game. And so that's, as I said, part of the litany that we're looking at. They don't obey international rules of the road, uh, whether it's WTO or elsewhere. There's no social, there's no corporate governance. There's no transparency and disclosure. There's no rule of law. So you can forget about those things, and yet we look the other way. 
because companies think they're going to sell that billion widgets uh, to this illusory group of Chinese consumers, we're still buying into even that canard, which is, which is a sad state of affairs. Now, given, again, the limited time, I would just go to some good news. And the good news is that just as we seem intent on compromising our basic freedoms and fundamental values at the hands of the greatest existential threat that our country has ever known, riding to the rescue, uh, as I'll get into this a little bit later, are the following issues in play. Quick, very quick. Let's talk real estate sector of China. 30% GDP. 60% of the revenues of the provinces. 60%. What do they do? They, all they did was sell land to the Evergrands and others to fund themselves. You know they're already destitute now. They're getting bailouts from Beijing now. The provinces are on their behinds. How do you lose 60% of your revenues and stay a going concern? What about debt to GDP ratio? They say it's 300. Let's try 325 to 350 conservatively when you think of shadow banking and off balance sheet uh, activities, which are bountiful to say the least. Look at the COVID zero fiasco. Providential in a way. I mean, they got stuck on an unworkable policy there. Thank goodness they've had to maintain it through the party congress. You know, every day is a gift for us that they stick with COVID zero. And then there's the missteps with Putin, not exactly an ideal bosom buddy uh, in the midst of his own genocidal campaign in Ukraine, not to mention that natty problem of currently losing. Uh, you saw that today that he wants to race through those annexations of Donbass and Donetsk so that he can legally pursue uh, tactical and battlefield nuclear weapons. So you'll be hearing a lot more nuclear saber rattling soon on that. But I would argue that it's not so hot for President Xi because he's attached at the hip to his no limits partnership with Russia. It was just a bad idea. Uh, so, and the drought and the plummeting growth rate. I mean, all these things are creating slow motion economic implosion for China. And that, in my opinion, is being accelerated. So, we could go on about um, other aspects of what she has done, centralizing corporate CCP, as I call it, uh, costing a, tri a trillion five hundred billion by going to going to war with the tech sector, uh, education and gaming sectors, uh, crushing of Hong Kong's freedoms, etc. So she has advertised the bullying, aggressive, belligerent attitude of China uh, more forthrightly than anyone else. So what do we do in the balance of time uh, legislatively? Now, I, I pay a lot of attention to the money because I think the money is the least discussed uh, linchpin to the CCP remaining a going concern. And again, without those multi-billion dollar, multi, sorry, trillion dollar flows of funds from unwitting American retail investors into the coffers of the CCP, they cannot make it. I mean, you talk about, you know, like what's, what's China gonna look like 10 years from now, 20 years from now, 50 years from now? I don't think that's happening. Three to five years, maybe. But I can tell you, if we ever stopped the wholesale bailout of that failed experiment over there, things would move quickly. This is a real-time world, and the markets are ferocious. You know, when they reach a tipping point and they see more risk than they see gain, when they do more short-selling than long-selling, that's the beginning of the end. 
for Xi Jinping and company. So I think that that day may be coming, and so what do we need to do to get on top of things uh, for a change here? And one is, and I'll name the coalition because it says it all, no TSP for the CCP. I mean, the Thrift Savings Plan is now has 35 Chinese companies in the international fund of the TSP that 7, 8 million American federal employees are probably holding, as well as our military. Hundreds more bad actors, including sanctioned Chinese companies, are part of the TSP's mutual fund window. That's coming down the pike at flank speed. And um, we need to harmonize sanctions. You know, again, you've got 500 Chinese companies on the entity list prohibited from selling, uh, be, being sold American equipment and technology because of their egregious human rights and national security abuses. And yet, how many of those are on the, on the OFAC list that you can't, you can't that lose access to our capital markets? Thirteen. Thirteen out of 500. Is that, is that denote seriousness? No. It denotes a revolving door at Treasury, the SEC, and the NEC that are not serious about trying to protect American investors and ensure proper fiduciary responsibilities, much less defend our fundamental values and human rights policies and our national security. Now, and the last thing I would mention before Sehun takes out the cane here is A shares. It sounds exotic. Uh, these are shares that are bought right out of Shanghai, Shenzhen, and, uh, and uh, sorry, Shanghai, Shenzhen, and Beijing all have exchanges, but it's the two first ones that are the big ones. Anyway, catch this. There are over 4,000 A share companies in the portfolios of the American people. We have the data. We can prove where they are, which indexes are carrying them, which index funds are carrying them, BlackRock, Fidelity, State Street, et cetera, et cetera. These A shares avoid scrutiny entirely. There's no diligence performed on them. Many of them are sanctions violators. And yet, this is all done with impunity. Not one Chinese company in the American markets today is compliant with federal securities laws, not one. And yet, the free lunch program goes on. So I would just close by one sentence, which is that I think that we may be facing here the greatest financial scandal in world history. This is the multi-trillion dollar underwriting by a democracy, notably our own, of a totalitarian police state bent on our destruction, aided by greed-driven Wall Street firms, and at best, conflicted U.S. government regulators, primarily at Treasury, the SEC, and the NEC. So with that sobering statement, uh, I'd like to turn it over to Ennis. Thanks. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Mr. Robinson, for um, just uh, kicking it off with the great introduction. Now, um, given the time constraint, uh, and I, I've just inf been informed that there's a session that's about to uh, take place, uh, uh, but despite that, Congressman Louis Gomer um, has taken his time to come and stand with us. So uh, without further ado, we'd like to give a, um, please give a round of applause to Congressman Louis Gohmert. Thank you. I want to shake your hand. Thank you for all your work. Uh, yeah, plain spoken is a good thing in America. It's when we try to intimidate people out of saying what truth is that uh, we run into trouble in our country. But, uh, yeah, I appreciate those remarks as well. It is unbelievable how much funding we are doing of a communist country. I, I was an exchange student for a summer 
to a country at that time called the Soviet Union. Perhaps you've heard of it. And I know Margaret Thatcher said, you know, communism always fails when you run out of other people's money. Well, what I noticed was, and, and communist China has a little different economy from the way the Soviet Union worked, but I was out at a collective farm and there are thousands of acres. I couldn't tell what had been planted and what hadn't been. It was just brown. And all of the farmers were sitting in the shade in the middle of the morning, in the shade of a tree in the middle of their village. And so I tried to use my best Russian and say with a smile so they wouldn't hit me, uh, when do you work out in the field? Because I've worked on farms and, and in the summer like this was, you get out there at sun up so you can finish before the sun gets too hot. And here it was mid morning. This is prime work time and they're all sitting in. So when do you work out in the field? And they all laughed and I thought, Oh, I may have said it wrong. And one of the farmers said in Russian, I make the same number of rubles if I'm out there in the sun or I'm here in the shade, so I stay in the shade. And so I thought even better than Margaret Thatcher's line is when people find out they'll make about the same amount of money if they work really hard or they don't work at all. Well, eventually, even the hardest workers rein in and quit working so hard. Now, China has tried to, the communist Chinese have tried to get around that by letting some people keep a little of their own money. And that was smart. That may help them last more than 70 years. But what is scary is what you just heard about. And I mean, for this administration, to say, gosh, you know, we got hundreds of millions, billions of dollars in all of our um, pension plans, in our federal pension plan. Let's go invest that in China. Oh, my. Oh, my. You know, there, there are reasons that in different cultures, they're similar old saying to what's in the Bible. You don't want to be a borrower or a lender. You don't want to be propping up a country, a, a government rather, that wants you to fail. That's insane. And yet we are doing it. And so I, I appreciate so much this organization trying to get the truth out. But you can see... There are not enough people yet that get how important this is. But you can start with 12 disciples and end up doing quite well and getting your message out if people will work to get the message out. You know, I've been saying for years that I believed that as soon as the communist Chinese government was able to get to a place where they could let America's economy fail and not be wiped out themselves, that that was a goal they were moving toward. And I still believe that's the case. Um, but we are voluntarily getting to that point where we are too reliant I mean, we didn't have this kind of investment in the Soviet Union. If we had, they would have continued to last longer. Uh, you, you, you don't do this for a government that wants to see you fail. And so I appreciate the wisdom that I've heard here that I know that is, um, that you're proliferating, getting out and, and really, you're a courageous guy. You are. And it takes courage to be willing to have people call you stupid. But you know what you know. 
And you know the people that have been harmed by this form of government. Now, uh, back in the 1800s, a writer, Dostoevsky, Russian writer, he was responding to some idiot named Karl Marx who had this great idea that at some point workers of the world would unite. And to me, someone who could not even foresee the formation of labor unions probably is not the prophet you ought to listen to. Dostoevsky, he saw all the problems with communism, but he made the statement, and Soshenitsyn quoted him in the Gulag Archipelago, uh, Dostoevsky said, the problem with communism is not economic. Well, I hope we all know it is an economic problem, but Dostoevsky saying that's not the main problem. He said, not economic. The problem with communism is atheism. Government must be God in a communist country. There's no room for other gods. And i never forget, there was one authorized seminary, Christian seminary, in the Soviet Union during those days. They allowed 40 people to come in and be educated at the seminary. And go, it's about three hour drive outside of Moscow. But there was a building, I don't know, five or six stories or so, had, as you turned into the gate of this church and seminary, and it was a face of linen, and I'd just seen his body down at Red Square. He was really dead. And it may have been true that his ear rotted and they replaced it with a rubber one. I don't know. But he was dead, dead, that was for sure. But in Russian, it said, linen... Tsunami. Lenin is with us. And the message is clear. You may be turning into this Christian school, but the message is that God is Lenin. You can't have any other God in a communist country. And so people aren't free to seek and look for truth. They have to accept what uh, amounts to a ministry of truth. My daughter lived in uh, China for five years in Shanghai. And as I'm sure most of you know, if you get online and you say something that the government thinks may be a little inappropriate or perhaps a little critical, you're off the internet. So you try to work out ways to be able to communicate without getting cut off because China, just like in Orwell's 1984, uh, they have what you could call a ministry of truth. It doesn't matter how many lies the ministry of truth propagate. If you say anything that's not in line with what the ministry of truth says, then you get cut off and you have a good chance of getting arrested. And after the government arrested one of the top artists, and my daughter was an artist that was teaching art over there. Um, I said, sweetheart, I think it may be time to go elsewhere. So anyway, she's just gotten her master's in fine art. But, but there is not yet the freedom that the people deserve. And in a meeting with some of their top ministers, uh, I asked the question, and they, they understood English, but, you know, they would wait for the translator. And I said, what are you basing the value of your currency on? And the answer came back, we base it on a basket full of currencies. So I asked, what currencies are in the basket and the response is many different currencies and the question then was what are the names of the currencies 
He said, there's many names of many currencies. And this went on, and, and I was going to keep asking until finally the other Americans said, um, I, I don't think we're going to get an answer. Let's move on. I wasn't going to quit. Because the answer is, they're not a whole bunch of different international currencies. They set the currency of what they want it to be. And that makes it easily manipulated. This could be one of our greatest allies in the world. Could be our greatest ally. But never as long as the Chinese government is in charge. They want to take us down, and I will thank God when that government is gone and we can be friends. And I hope nobody with Chinese background is insulted by this statement, but spending uh, the longest I've been there was a week and a half. You get away from Beijing and Shanghai, and they remind me of Southern Americans, people in the South of America because they're so hospitable. And they want to, like my grandmother, they want to keep forcing you to eat. Oh, eat the, you know, they just can't do enough for you. Now that's a country I want to be friends with, but not until the Chinese government is gone. So thank you so much for letting me be here with you. And thank you for being here. The message is going to get out and you're helping. Thank you. Well, thank you so much. And, and again, we thank all the congressional uh, staffers um, that have stopped by, you know, despite the last minute session that went on. But um, good to see all the good folks here. So now, um, without further ado, please welcome Mr. Ennis Cantor Freedom, a hero to us all, to share um, his experiences uh, with the NBA and uh, his perspective on this issue. Okay. I'm just going to use this one because this is hard this is perfect this is working or not but this is a this is a tough one i can really reach out okay i'll use this one don't worry about it because i don't i just didn't want to lean perfect it's a high difference a little bit, yeah, perfect. Okay. Um, first of all, thank you guys for inviting me here. It's definitely a very important topic. Um, I want to tell you guys about a little bit about my story so you guys can see how these dictatorships are actually controlling 100% American-made companies. And obviously, MBA was one of them, but it was not the only one. You know, till, since I changed my last name to Freedom, I actually was, you know, doing a lot of research about, you know, the freedom in America. And the more I, do, more I have done a research, the, the more question I ask myself, are we really free? Because when we let these dictatorships run pretty much 100% um, American-made companies like, you know, MBA and Hollywood and Wall Street and big techs and academias and even Congress and some of the lo local congresses, I ask that question to myself every day, are we really uh, free? Um, you know, how my story started, obviously, I started to, I'm sure you guys know it, but I started to talk about the problems that were happening in Turkey the last 10 years, because obviously as not, it's, not, it's not as bad as China, but, you know, in Turkey, there are lots of, obviously, human rights violations and political prisons, and there are so many, you know, media outlets has been shut down, and there are so many journalists are in the jail right now because of what they have said. Um, you know, I was trying to bring awareness about what's going on over there and the things that I talk about affected me and my family just because of I talk about the human rights violations over there. It happened over there in Turkey. You know, they put my dad in jail, and he was 100% innocent. Um, you know, my you know, my little brother was actually playing basketball. He got kicked out in every team because of the same last name. My, brother, my sister was going to medical school for six years. She still cannot find a job till this day. So the more I, I talk about the problems that were happening in, in Turkey, the more me and my family got affected. You know, my name is now on Interpol list, and uh, my passport has been revoked and stuff. And uh, 
in this 10 years of, you know, uh, period, you know, MBA really helped me a lot. Really, you know, the commissioner texted me twice on my phone and said, listen, you are fighting, you, you are given the good fight, and please l l let us know if we can do anything for you. And that actually gave me so much hope. That actually gave me so much hope because when you know the MBA and commissioner and your teammate and your coaches and everyone has your back, that gave me extra motivation to fight for uh, what's right. And uh, <clears throat> just last summer, I was actually doing a basketball camp in New York. And I remember after the basketball camp, I was taking pictures with the kids one by one. And I took a picture with this kid. And his parents called me out in front of everybody and said, how can you call yourself a human rights activist when your Muslim brothers and sisters are getting tortured and raped every day in, in China in concentration camps? And I'm still smiling for the camera. And I was just shocked. I turned around to that parent. I was like, I promise I'm going to get back to you. So that day, I canceled everything. I went back to my hotel room. I started to study about what's going on over there, you know? And the more I have done research, the more I'm like, okay, there's, you know, Uyghurs and there's, you know, Taiwanese people, then Hong Kongers and Mongolians and, you know, all this, um, all this uh, different group are being, you know, really in, in pain, Tibetans. Um, I promised myself that they'd be, I was like, I don't care what happens, I'm just going to go out there and say it like it is. I'm just going to tell about, and the thing is, it's human rights. So I don't care if you're from the right, you're from the left, or whoever you're cheering for, you have to care about human rights because it's above politics. So I had a conversation with um, my manager. I was like, listen, you know, I'm, I started to do our research about all the human rights violations happening in Turkey, uh, sorry, in, in China, but, uh, I mean, there's all kind of news out there. You cannot really trust the Internet. I was like, I need you to find me a concentration camp survivor, which I can sit down and have a conversation with her. So he found me one. Uh, he found me a woman, then we sit down, had a, an hour conversation. And, you know, she was telling me about how, you know, the people over there was, I don't want to get into too much details, but how they were getting torture and gang rape, how they were, you know, forced abortion and sterilization and organ harvesting and surveillance cameras. So I was like, it was just so hard to even believe what she was saying. End of our conversation, I asked her, what can I do to help? How can I help you? She said, I'm good. I don't need your help. Then I was like, why do we have this one-hour conversation? She was like, I'm good. I'm in America. I have my freedom here. You know, I can eat whatever I want. I can go uh, wherever I want. I just need you to help those two, three million people who are in concentration camps are getting in torture every day. So hearing this, I was like, I don't care how much money is involved or what kind of career that you have, you have to stand up for those innocent people. So um, I wanted to do it in a very unique way because I remember when I was a kid, whenever I watched an NBA game, the first thing I was watching and looking at was the shoes, what kind of shoes the NBA players were wearing, you know? Because, I mean, everyone in the world loves shoes, you know, especially the kids these days. You know, they all have their own brand and own player that, that, that they follow. They go and buy their shoes. So I wanted to create these shoes, which, which, you know, I wanted to make it in a very unique way because I was researching all the shoes that has some kind of like a slave labor in it. I was like, I want to create a shoes which has 100% no slave, uh, slave labor. And I want to put these, you know, struggles around the world on the shoes and just go out there and play basketball, which I looked before, there was no rule against it. So I, I'm sure you guys have watched basketball because I'm a basketball fan. Uh, I was playing for the Celtics, and my first game was against New York Knicks. And I'm, I'm, you guys know New York Knicks and Boston Celtics' biggest rivalry in Eastern Conference. And the game was on Madison Square Garden, the most famous arena in the world. So I put the shoes on. My first, um, my first message was free Tibet. You know, it was a very simple uh, message, hashtag free Tibet, right? Because I was seeing two years ago when we were in an NBA uh, bubble, all these players were putting on their shoes saying, you know, say her name or I can't breathe or Black Lives Matter, which I'm 
you know, cool with. Um, so I was like, so there's no rule against it. So I put the shoes on, went out there the minute before the game. The, the game hasn't started yet. The minute be before the game, two of the NBA officials came to me and said, you have to take your shoes off. And I was just very shocked. I'm like, I cannot believe that, that what they were saying. Um, I was like, what do you mean? They said, well, your shoes have been getting so much attention internationally, and we've been getting so many phone calls. You have to take your shoes off, which the game hasn't started yet. It was the perfect moment because I was just getting ready for my citizenship test. So I closed my eyes. I was like, okay, there are 27 amendments. My first amendment, freedom of speech. I was like, no, I'm not taking my shoes off. And uh, they were shocked. They were literally shocked. They were like, what are you talking about? I was like, I'm not taking my shoes off. There is no rule against it. Go tell your boss that I'm not going to uh, take my shoes off. Um, then halftime happened, right? Halftime happened. I went back to my locker room. I looked at my phone. There was thousands of notifications. I clicked on the one that my manager sent me. He said, every Celtics game is banned in television. Think about it. For one half is only 24 minutes. First quarter, 12 minutes. Second quarter, 12 minutes. In 24 minutes, they took off every Celtics game on television, rest of the season. Rest of the season. I texted him back. I was like, well, that pretty much shows, that pr shows the dictatorship and censorship over there. That actually helps me. Um, after the game, there was pretty much every media outlet in the world was reaching out. And I was like, I'm not doing no media. I didn't want my teammate to think that I'm doing this for attention or I'm doing this for media or anything like that. I was like, you know what? For the next two, three weeks, I'm not doing no media. Um, after, the, uh, after the game, NBA called me. And they were like, listen, you know what you did. You cannot wear those shoes ever again. I was like, is there any rule against it? They said, no. But you know, this is a business, you know? And at that moment, I'm like, I cannot believe it. So I talk about the problems that were happening in Turkey the last 10 years. I did not get one phone call. I talk about the problems that were happening in China. My phone was ringing once every hour. It got to a point they were harassing me and my manager so much. I was like, you know what? Promise you. I'm not going to wear free to best shoes ever again. They said, promise? I said, promise. I hang up the phone. The next game, I wore free Uyghur shoes. You know? It was a... Uh, so it was so funny. By the way, I did not play a minute in this game. Prior, previous games, I played every game. Anyway, um, after the second game, they called me. They was like, you're a liar. We can't believe you lied to us, blah, blah, right? I was like, first of all, listen, I never said I'm not going to wear free Uyghur shoes. I just said I'm just not going to wear free Tibet shoes. So at that moment, they, under they understand that I'm not going to Apologize. I'm not going to take my tweet down. They're not because two years ago, when one of the general manager of you know Houston Rockets, I'm sure you guys know the story really well, tweeted about it and said free Hong Kong, right? Um, they made him took his tweet down. They made him apologize, and which the ugly part of it, not many people uh, knows about this, but they put two statements out there. One was for the world was saying that we stand with our, you know, employee, we have a, he has freedom of speech, you can't say whatever he wants. The second one was for the Chinese government, saying that we are sorry, he didn't know enough about it. And two years ago, around those times, the Celtics, I was still playing for the Celtics, they made me media unavailable for two weeks because they knew that I could care less. I, I could just go out there and just say anything, you know? So they made me, in America, they made me media unavailable for two weeks when that happened. So I was like, this is crazy. Um, well, back then I didn't know enough about Hong Kong, you know, but now obviously uh, before I got fired or banned, whatever, from the NBA, now I, I knew uh, more about it. So that general manager called me and said, listen, they made me took my tweet down. They made me apologize. They made me say these kind of things. You don't apologize. You keep going, you know, because what you're standing for is right. So after hearing that, I'm like, I don't care, you know, I don't care who I'm fighting against. I'm just going to just do my best. So after the second, first or second game, one of my teammates woke up to me 
in a locker room and said, you know, this is your last year in NBA, right? Like, you know, you talk about the Chinese government, you talk about, you calling out Nike, you calling out some of the players who are bowing down to these dictatorships, your career is over. I hope you win a championship this year. Have fun with it. Smile, because you're not going to get another contract after this. Um, it was the perfect moment because it was right before the Beijing Olympics. So I try to reach out to not just the athletes in the NBA. I literally try to reach out to all the athletes around America and also Olympians. I was like, listen, do not be part of their propaganda. You know, you cannot just... Um, go and just be part of the propaganda. And uh, they all said the same thing. They said, listen, I think what you're doing is so amazing. Keep doing what you're doing. We love you. We support you. But we just cannot do it out loud. I asked them why. They said, well, you know, we have shoe deals, jersey sales. We want to get another contract. We want to do this and that. I asked them one simple question. I was like, put yourself in their shoes. If your mother... If your daughter, if your sister or whoever was in those concentration camps and getting tortured and raped every day, would you, stay, would you still stay silent? No answer. They usually turn around and leave. Um, it was the last, I will say, six, seven months has been very, very lonely because the people that I call, I will say, my brothers, you know, because I, I, I saw my teammates every day. They literally become my brothers. So my teammates, my coaches, the fans, and everyone from the NBA, after I got fired in February, I did not hear one phone call, one text message. At least just say, hey, man, good luck with your next chapter. You know, good luck with what you're doing. Keep giving the good fight. Not one of them. Um, they all I'm follow me on social media, which I don't need their following or anything like that. Um, they, now I, you know what, I was like, you know what, I'll be the bigger guy and I will text them first. I texted them, called them, no answer. And that actually did break my heart because I was like, God, they were, we want to battle together. We won games, we lost games, we laughed together, we cried together. But now I played 11 years in the league. I have hundreds of teammates. I have tens of uh, coaches. Not one of them reached out and said, good luck. Um, but then I come here and, you know, meet with people like you guys, like this hero right here, like this guy right here, and uh, everyone in this room. I was like, I'm not alone in this. That is, the, I think, the one thing that gives me the most motivation because at first, after I got fired from the NBA, I was like, God, I'm actually, I'm literally alone in this. There is no one, not one player, not one athlete, forget about the NBA, for, around the world, that one athlete is standing right beside me. And that actually really put me in a bad mood. I was asking myself, like, am I doing something wrong? I was like, I never said, I never talk about politics. I have never said, even about Turkey, I never said, vote for this guy, don't vote for that guy. I never said about even China or any, anywhere else in the world, vote for this guy, don't vote for that guy. Um, only thing I have said is just stand up for human rights violations over there in China or Turkey or whoever. Um, that showed me a lot. That actually showed me that how people can pick money over their morals, principles, and values. And that broke my heart big time. Um, but, you know, like I... Like I said, again, the more I research about the freedom, the more um, I'm seeing that we have a lot of work to do because NBA is only just one organization. You know, you see all the other organizations. You see, like, things like Hollywood, and he was talking about Wall Street and maybe big tags and academias and even some of the Congress people and local congresses. I was like, we are pretty much controlled by the dictatorships out there. And we have to do whatever we can to just bring that freedom again into America. Because when I remember when I was a kid, the first thing that I think about America, it was freedom. But now the more research I have done, I'm asking this question to myself, are we really free or not? Um, you know, with that being said, thank you guys so much. Uh, we need to think about not just coming here and telling our stories. We need to think about 
coming up with ideas. You know, we need to take some actions. I think coming here, talking about it, being in the media is, is cool and everything. But what he was saying was, you know, we need to come up with some, you know, solid actions. Because I believe that Chinese government is the biggest threat in the world right now, in a free society and everywhere. So I feel like we have to do whatever we can to bring awareness, one. And then two, you know, take some actions. So with that being said, thank you guys so much. I appreciate it. And, um... Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Freedom and Mr. Robinson. You know, it's because of heroes like these two um, that we, as the everyday common folk, um, can be reminded of the freedoms that we have today. And, and again, uh, for all the congressional uh, staff and all the personnel who also might be watching this through our live stream uh, because of the last minute sessions, um, we, we extend our gratitude and appreciation uh, for coming. Uh, you know, I, let me just share something uh, quickly before uh, we wrap up our program. You know, this, uh, when, when, I, when I met Anna, Mr. NS Cantor Freedom and uh, Mr. Robinson, you know, one thing just really came into my mind is, and, and, and it was the following, is that how much do we really value the freedom that we have in this country? And I do think that with such uh, reminders, uh, we can in fact become better citizens and we can in fact use that knowledge in order to combat uh, this evil called the Chinese Communist Party. We're also, I'm very honored to have our uh, friends from the Falun Gong community. Uh, personally for me, I've, I've, I'm a huge benefactor of all of their, uh, all their great work um, and, and, and even our Hong Kong friends and, um, and, 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 and various uh, communities who'll be, who, you know, who's, who's watching this. And, as for myself being a native uh, Korean American, actually who immigrated from Korea, you know, it's the freedom is something that uh, my my grandfather and, my, and his generation had to had to fight has, had to fight for, and to have these great figures um, again to remind us of all of that is absolutely stunning. So um, we do have a bit of a tight schedule with Mr. Freedom, so he does have to leave uh, in a bit. But um, you know, uh, if you do have any questions, please, please, please keep the questions brief, on, and and uh, we will end our program right now, but um, uh, if uh, Mr. Freedom uh, does have a few minutes to spare, um, please um, ask the questions afterwards. So without further ado, on behalf of the Captive Nations Coalitions of the Committee on Present Danger China and the Committee on Present Danger China, we thank you for your participation and we hope that this was an informative event. So thank you so much and God bless you all. Thank you.